Welcome to our webinar, How to Expand Your Orthopedic Market Through MDSAP. Today's webinar will help you identify the critical elements required for the Medical Device Single Audit Program. SGS serves as a sponsor and expert for our webinar. Our speakers are Timothy Gooch, Global MDSAP Product Manager, and Daniel Torres, Regional Sales Manager. SGS is the world's leading testing, inspection, and certification company. Its medical device advisors provide orthopedic companies guidance from the design stage through the whole product life cycle. Thank you to SGS for sponsoring our webinar, and Tim and Dan, thank you for sharing your expertise today. I would like to welcome you to start your presentation. Today, we're going to discuss how to expand medical device market through MedSAP. Uh, my name is Daniel Torres. I'm the regional sales manager for medical device here at SGS. My help companies get certified and tested to get their product into whatever international market they're trying to reach. The main speaker today is Tim Gooch. He's the global MedSAP product manager. He manages the MedSAP program for SGS globally. He's responsible for implementation and sustained effectiveness. The MedSAP program at SGS meets the needs of medical device manufacturers in over 20 countries globally, and we hope to uh, give you some more helpful info on that. Today's agenda, um, what is MedSAP and requirements? We're going to explain how each of the country jurisdiction works, uh, how it can help you get your product to market faster, and how to successfully implement MedSAP in your company. A little history about SGS. We've been in business for 140 years. We were founded in 1878. And we're basically all over the world. We have 2,600 offices. It says 89,000 employees. We're now up to 110,000 employees. And we're the world's number one testing and inspection company. Things that SGS provides, uh, provide certification. We provide training, performance assessments, assess and improve performance of business operations. We do supply chain risk management. We help minimize the supply chain risks by gaining visibility of your suppliers. And also we do technical consulting. We improve productivity and operational efficiency at your company. And now I'll hand it over to Tim Gooch. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thanks to Carolyn and Bone Zone for having us today. We appreciate the opportunity to talk about this and hopefully to lend some information that will be helpful to you in uh, your organization to either continue on with MDSAP or to become a participant in the MDSAP program. I talk about MDSAP an awful lot, and it seems like there are so many things going on in the regulatory world these days with you know, changes in, in the EU and then also in the UK and then expansion of MDSAP and how the MDSAP program has really gained a lot of traction over the first few years of existence and now considering partnering with the EU. And uh, there's just an awful lot that is going on between us who are involved with MDSAP and with the other regulatory stakeholders. Give me a little bit of a background on uh, MDSAP. Uh, it was an idea that really came about in 2012. There was the first meeting of the IMDRF. This is after the GHTF was uh, no, no longer functioning, but changed over to IMDRF, uh, mostly for just positioning reasons between one group to the next. But that's when it was really discussed as an opportunity for regulators to come together to form one set of rules and then to be able to audit organizations and to certify them so that it might speed along their access to international markets, no matter where they are. So the, the rules began to take shape and there were groups of the initial uh, stakeholders, five different jurisdictions, Japan coming in late, and uh, began a pilot program through mostly the control of the FDA but with the participation in all five. And then uh, at the end of uh, 2015, beginning of 2016, Health Canada made an announce announcement that MDSAP was gonna be the only way, the only game in town for legally marketing a medical device in Canada for class two, three, and four devices. 
2017, at the end of the pilot program, uh, we began doing work in earnest. And it has been growing very quickly since then um, with many thousands of certificates that have been issued to medical device organizations so that they may be able to address the QMS requirements for marketing authorization in the five ju different jurisdictions. Let's talk about what it is. There are many of you I know that have participated in MDSAP, you're well aware of what it is, but some have not. So to give you an idea, it's, it's a, a single audit that was designed to address primarily the centralized functions of ISO 1345. That's the most recognized standard for metal device manufacturing. And it became the centerpiece of all that we do in MDSAP. And then there was also Areas are for regulatory conformity that were to be measured through this program that would meet the requirements that were similar to those in 1345, but were outside of what those requirements were. And so each of the uh, jurisdictions developed a list of requirements that were like other requirements of other countries, but said, you know, we want these auditors to look at these specific things. And those became the list of country specific requirements, along with the standard requirements of ISO 1345. So there are several different key players in MDSAP. There's the regulators themselves. They make their own rules in their own jurisdictions for how they want medical devices to be regulated. Each of them have the opportunity to send two senior managers within their jurisdiction to participate in the Regulatory Authority Council. So the, these are the individuals that really govern the decisions that have to be made for the greater group of MDSAP. Of course, there's the manufacturers. The manufacturers are those who either currently market their medical devices in the five jurisdictions, plan to market their devices in the five jurisdictions. And now just recently, we've, uh, we have an, a way to expand, not the certification, but participation into the program for contract manufacturers, specifically for contract manufacturers, sterilizers, and designers. There's also, of course, the the standards and the regulations, they are what we refer to as we audit medical device organizations and contract manufacturers. There's also a, a computer database that we use where the regulators may exchange information and view the information that is in the audit reports, nonconformity reports, and any other data that we upload into this database. There are the medical device single audit program auditing organizations, of which SGS is one. I believe that there are about 11 to 13 that are recognized or authorized to conduct MDSAP audits and to issue certificates. Then, of course, there's the MDSAP reports. There are two of them. There's one for nonconformities and then the audit report itself. And keep in mind that when you participate in the program, those audit reports are not necessarily written for you. When we audit medical device organizations in MDSAP, our customer is the regulator. And so we become the eyes and ears of the regulator as so that they can know exactly what's going on with companies that are uh, distributing medical devices in their jurisdiction. And the MDSAP certificates, as again, in the each jurisdiction treats the certificates and the reports differently, and we'll go into that in just a moment. There are five jurisdictions and the, the regulators that participate, TGA of Australia, uh, Brazil and Visa, Health Canada, PMDA in Japan, and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. In each of these jurisdictions and the regulators participate at different levels. So when you participate in the program, 
don't enter into it thinking that you're going to receive the same treatment from Japan, for instance, that you would in Canada, because those jurisdictions use the reports and the certificates in different ways. Similar, but not always exactly the same. So let's talk about a little bit how they differ. So Australia uses the uh, audit reports and the certificates as evidence of conformity or compliance to the, the standards and to the regulations in the TGA. Unless they have a particular device that is excluded or exempt or restricted by their current policies. And you may see on your certificate where things may be a little bit different from each of the jurisdictions. And we detail those in our certificates. For instance, if a device does or does not require design controls, or if it's banned in a certain jurisdiction. So the certificate covers all the devices under the scope of certification with differences, but we detail those differences on the certificate. So the participating manufacturers may avoid a routine TGA inspection, but they have the right to inspect anyone. And uh, so it doesn't necessarily preclude TGA from visiting your manufacturing site. So the certificates are treated similarly to others uh, overseas regulators provided that all Australian requirements are covered at the audit. And we'll talk about how we cover all of the requirements later. Brazil similarly uses both the report and the certificates. They issue a Brazilian GMP certificate if there are no grade fours or five nonconformities. And incidentally, MDSAP uses a, a nonconformity grading system of one through five. Any grade uh, one through C, uh, three NCs have, uh, that have a satisfactory corrective action plan will be issued a GMP certificate. Any five-day notices related to patient safety or public health are investigated, but they don't investigate five-day notices uh, outside of the regulatory requirements for Brazil. So what is a five-day notice? A five-day notice is issued whenever a manufacturer receives more than two grade four nonconformities or one or more grade five nonconformities. Health Canada. Canada, it's the only jurisdiction that requires MDSAP participation for classes two, three, and four. And then the certificate is issued as evidence of conformity to the Canadian medical device regulation. They may investigate five-day notifications issued by an auditing organization, but they do not investigate issues related to other jurisdictions. In Japan, they use the MDSAP audit report as a trial. And this trial is to be used to possibly exempt a manufacturing site from on-site inspection or to allow the manufacturing authorized, uh, authorization holder, the MA, to substitute considerable parts of the documentation required for inspection with the MDSAP report. In the US, the MDSAP audit and report serves as a substitution for regularly scheduled inspections. So many manufacturers see this as a great benefit because they seem to enjoy our company a lot more company than the company of the FDA in their shops. So now that does not necessarily mean that the FDA will not come to visit you. The FDA has the provision for always being able to come for cause or if there are compliance follow-ups, for instance, if you have an outstanding requirement from the FDA, such as a warning letter, then a, we cannot close a warning letter. They must do that. Uh, they may do it with the assistance of an MDSAP report. And we often get requests from the FDA on certain issues that they receive from uh, either about manufacturers or from manufacturers 
to see if they can gather enough information from our audit reports to be able to close down any regulatory issues. And uh, like most of the other jurisdictions, they do not regard nonconformities outside of its own regulations. So let's talk about what the MDSAP documents are. Those were the centerpiece of our slide earlier. So those are going to be ISO 1345, 2016, currently, and then the laws, directives, acts, and regulations of the five jurisdictions. So the auditors, when they come in, they've got a lot of information to cover and to have working knowledge of when they come on site. Uh, MDSAP is one of the most intense training programs that we put auditors through because there's just so much information. Also, an important document and probably the most important document for you in preparation for an MDSAP audit is the MDSAP audit approach, which can be downloaded from the FDA website. I'll show you later where you can find that. But it will tell you everything that the auditing organization is going to want to look at. Also, it's going to tell you exactly how we as an organization assess conformity to every single requirement in MDSAP. So it's an important document. I encourage companies to download it and read it twice, become very familiar with it. Uh, if you've got a printed copy, it needs to show up at your audit with coffee stains on it because it's it's where you need to spend most of your time in, in preparation for an MDSAP audit. There's also the audit report, which um, starts off as a blank document that's about 20 pages long. And then the auditor fills in this document. It's a template that states everything that is required of them. And you can also look at that report on your own. And then you can see how it matches up um, with the requirements that are in the MDSAP audit approach document. So they are in sync. Also, there's the MDSAP nonconformity grade exchange form, which is a separate report that links to the audit report and holds the nonconformities in great detail and will explain exactly how the nonconformity was raised the evidence that supports the nonconformity, and then how the grade of the nonconformity is calculated. The regulatory exchange platform secure is REPS. It's a secure database into which the auditing organizations are required to upload data and information outputs from audit visits. So every, all of the required and applicable documentation for MDSAP is uploaded into that database for the regulators to have access to. As we said earlier, the MDSAP Regulatory Authority Council, there are two managers from each jurisdictions and their responsibility includes, uh, they, um, they do executive planning, strategic priorities, they set policy and make decisions on behalf of the MDSAP consortium. They review and approve all of the MDSAP documents, procedures, and work instructions. And all of those documents are available on the MDSAP website at the FDA. It also makes the decisions on which auditing organizations are approved and authorized and recognized as an MDSAP auditing organization. Without uh, those credentials, we cannot uh, issue legal certificates. So what are the requirements? The manufacturer must either currently market devices in one of, uh, or more of the five MD SAP jurisdictions or have plans to. Part of the lure of MD SAP is that it gives you the opportunity to meet the QMS requirements so that uh, you may then move on to the next step with each jurisdiction, which is the uh, marketing authorization, which involves the review of technical documentation. So uh, we can only provide the review of the QMS portion where the country 
or the jurisdiction must review the technical documentation. But I will tell you that uh, at SGS, we also are authorized to review um, low risk medical devices for 510K. So you may want to think uh, about that. And Dan can give you information concerning the 3P 510K program at uh, SGS. 3P 510K stands for third party 510K reviews. And then the manufacturer must be audited by an approved or recognized MDSAP auditing organization. So meeting the MDSAP expectations, we uh, you must meet the requirements of ISO 1345, all of the applicable regulatory requirements, all of the product and process related technologies and technical documentation. That's part of what we look at. We do not look at the technical documentation in terms of meeting the requirements for safety and effectiveness. However, we do make sure that the documentation that you do have meets the QMS requirements of each of the jurisdictions. We look at the, the requirements for sterile medical devices. We uh, need to make sure that you meet requirements for your initial approval uh, or the inclusion of your medical device on your certificate. And then we will also look at the records for those uh, sterile loads in that process at least once per three-year cycle. You have to meet the requirements for medical device adverse events and advisory notice reporting in each of the five jurisdictions. And then you must also meet uh, MDSAP requirements for written agreements. And this can be found in an annex that is attached to the audit approach document. So there are different types of MDSAP uh, audits. In the regular cycle, it's, which is a three-year cycle, very similar to ISO 1345, there's an initial audit that must be a stage two following a stage one document review process. In that documentation review process, we make sure that your organization has established all of the jurisdictional requirements for documentation. And then when we come back in for stage two, just like any other type of uh, audit, we will review records and assess the conformity to the requirements. There are two surveillance audits, and over the course of two surveillance audits, we will cover all of the requirements of MDSAP and then recertification at the three-year mark, and then the cycle starts. There are other types of audits, unannounced audits. So there are a few unannounced audits. This is only for manufacturers who hold a MBSAP certificate. We are required to perform an unannounced audit for manufacturers who have garnered more than two fours or one single five nonconformity, and that's by site. So if you're a multi-site organization and then only one of the sites receives a five-day notification, having more than two fours or a single five, then we must revisit that site within six to nine months. And then there are also special audits. Special audits may be because there are regulatory issues that SGS has become aware of that would uh, meet the criteria of the public health threat also, if we are requested to perform a, an unannounced audit by one of the five jurisdictions, and those would be conducted unannounced. So what are the benefits? So for medical device organizations, that means that you have legal responsibility for placing the device on the market. It meets the requirements for Health Canada. It's the only game in town for Health Canada for QMS certification. It speeds the marketing authorization in Australia, Brazil, Japan, and the US because it meets the requirements for those jurisdictions for certain risk levels of medical devices. It avoids scheduled inspections from the US FDA. And there are other jurisdictions for which it may avoid regularly scheduled inspections, but there's no guarantee. The only, only the FDA 
will take you off of their list of scheduled audits. In fact, they take you off of their scheduled list as soon as we notify them that you're participating in the program. So it's important that when you consider MDSAP that you make your decision quickly, we are required to notify them within three to five days and you come off the FDA's list. It also enhances regulatory efficiencies. It's only, it's one single audit to cover multiple jurisdictions. It's not just the five jurisdictions. There are also uh, affiliate programs that are now uh, participating, not as full fledged jurisdictions where we audit to their regulations, but also South Korea, Argentina, and Singapore are now participating as an affiliate member. Now let's talk a little bit about contract manufacturers and how it could possibly benefit you. We are not able to issue an MDSAP certificate at this time to contract manufacturers. However, we may issue a letter of conformity that states, it looks like a certificate, but it doesn't say certificate and it doesn't have the MDSAP logo on it, but it says that it meets the requirements, that you meet the requirements of MDSAP. Your participation as a contract manufacturer will also take you off the list with the FDA. And it demonstrates uh, conformity to the requirements of NBSAP to metal device organizations. So it can open up a large opportunity for you as a manufacturer, as a contract manufacturer to these participating metal device organizations. I used to be in the contract manufacturing business for many years. And uh, had we had this opportunity, I would have done this first. So let's talk about the audit approach document. This is the most important document that you will have for preparation for an MDSAP audit. And I've given the link here, which is a lot of letters and reading is hard. So you don't have to write all of that down, but if you will just do a search for MDSAP audit procedures and forms, then it will take you to this page as a choice. And then you want to look for the entry with the big orange arrow, and that will open up the MDSAP audit approach document. And the document, will describe each of the audit processes, and there are seven of them, management, device marketing authorization, facility registration, measurement analysis and improvement, adverse events reporting and uh, advisory notices, design development, production and purchasing. And within each of those processes are a number of audit tasks, and in the audit approach document, it tells the auditor exactly what to look for. And you will have a, your most readily available framework for you to prepare and choreograph your own audit in order to prepare for MDSAP. And also what's included in the MDSAP audit approach document are five different annexes or attachments that are outside of the main scope of the seven processes that come under audit. The first one is technical documentation. Technical documentation can be covered in all of the tasks that are within the audit model or the audit approach, but if you look under Annex 1, the audit approach that's related to technical documentation, it gives the auditor the clues of which documents that they should be pulling out and assessing for conformity. The same will be true for devices that are provided by the manufacturing organization for sterile medical devices. Also, there are requirements for adverse events and advisor notice reporting and then also for written agreements. 
So these are the things that typically will happen to a medical device organization, and they say, oh, my goodness, we, we're not meeting all of these requirements for written agreements when you could have looked in Annex 4 and known exactly which ones you need to make sure that you have in place. These are going to be agreements with suppliers. This is going to be agreements with uh, sponsors, detailing how you're going to exchange information and detailing which party in that agreement is responsible for what and how the communication is going to go back and forth between the manufacturer and the sponsor. Uh, also, just recently, Japan has uh, updated its QMS requirements to the 2016 ISO requirements and, and given a three-year transition period for those requirements. So those are the building blocks on which you will need to develop your own program. If you're already distributing in these jurisdictions, then there's little for you to do apart from making sure that you cite those requirements in your quality manual, make sure that you reference all of the regulations from each of the participating jurisdictions, and also understand that you're required to meet the regulations of the jurisdictions for those jurisdictions that apply to you. So if you have no intention of marketing your device in Australia and you don't currently have a license in Australia, then you don't need to worry about meeting those requirements. But I'll give you a little bit of a, an advance warning. We consistently come across manufacturers who have active licenses in some of these jurisdictions, and then we always go and look to see where you have licenses prior to coming on site. And then we will be looking for those written agreements with those countries and all those participating sponsors and so forth, and if you've met those requirements. And some people will say, well, yeah, we do have a license in, say, Brazil, but we've not sold anything there for five years or 10 years. We, do, we, don't, we don't have anyone who's actively selling, but the problem is, is that you do have an active license and you must meet those requirements. So let's look a little bit at, at what the audit approach document says. So in each of the processes, there are seven of them. There will be two interesting statements. The first one is the purpose for our auditing, for instance, the management process. And this will be, as it reads right here, the purpose of auditing the management process to verify top management ensures adequate and effective quality management system and everything that we are accustomed to reading in Clause 5 of ISO 1345. There's also an interesting uh, section on the outcomes, that as the result of our auditing this organization, we can show whether the, the manufacturer meets the, um, the evidence that is listed below, and there's actually a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I in the management section. So this is the end of that page in the, in the document. But this will give you a good clue as to what the auditor is trying to support in his recommendation for MDCEP certification or not. So let's talk a little bit about how to get there. The requirements of MDCEP are well documented. It's the most transparent an easy to understand set of regulations of any regulatory scheme. I read and study regulatory schemes for the rest of the planet because it's part of my job. And some of them are very difficult to navigate because it references back and forth from the end of the document to the beginning of the document and you have to flip and flop between the, the different sections in order to understand 
exactly what they're trying to get at as far as their requirements. But the regulatory requirements for MDSAP are all in the audit approach document. They're in the regulations that are referenced there just by the click of a button. And then you can also look at what is going to be going into your report and how the nonconformities are going to be graded. So it's important for you to know and understand what the requirements are. Take the information that I've outlined in this presentation so that you'll be able to see exactly what is required and uh, take those as a cue that you need to go have a look at these certain areas of your quality management system. Take advantage of the resources. Primarily, those are in the international programs on the FDA website. Just by searching for MDSAP uh, forms and documents, then you can will be able to get there easily. Download them, read them, study them, hold meetings with them and make assignments to different individuals, you know, your subject matter experts so that they can prepare to be audited. And third, probably the most important, in the audit approach document, you can see that uh, all that is required for the auditor to look at when we come on site for your initial audit. And you can take that and incorporate it into your in own internal audit program so that you can practice seeing what the requirements are, seeing how the nonconformities are raised, how they're graded, and then how you follow up in the post-audit period. There's a timeline of that is required. For instance, you have to have a corrective action plan within 15 days. This meets the requirements of the FDA, same as you would have on and establish an uh, inspection report from the FDA, the timeline requirements are the same. Also, there are requirements for putting into place your corrective actions for all grade four and five nonconformities. And we are required to make sure that those have been implemented prior to issuing a certificate. So those have to be implemented within 30 days. So Follow that same program that SGS would follow if it were coming on site at your organization to perform an audit and to issue a certificate. So this is all of the information that uh, I've had time to present. There's so much more, and we will have training programs uh, that are coming available that explains all of this in nauseating detail. And as a matter of fact, going through each of the tasks so that you can better prepare. So um, that's all that I have. I'm going to turn this back over to Dan. And thank you very much for your time and attention. All right. Thank you, Tim. That was great. Um, how can SGS help? Um, we can provide a gap assessment. Or we'll come on site or we can do it remotely and review your quality management system and let you know if it's good and if it's bad. And we'll give you a report on what needs to be fixed in order to uh, have a good audit. Um, we do training for your senior management, and uh, we also do introduction and foundation training courses uh, for people who are new to the medical device realm. We have training on documentation and implementing um, that documentation into your company's practices. We have internal auditing training, lead auditor training, and we can, like I said, do gap assessment or pre-audit on-site or off-site. When we do a certification audit for a company, it's uh, split into two phases, uh, stage one and stage two. Uh, the first phase is a uh, desk review, review your quality management system, um, and we'll let you know what we want to fix before we come back and uh, review the implementation at the company. Um, followed by that, the next year you'll have a surveillance audit um, that'll happen for the next two years. Uh, it's roughly one third of the time of the initial audit. And then after three years, you'll have a recertification audit and you'll start the cycle again with two surveillances after that. So here's uh, some of the medical device training courses that we have. Uh, one is for MedSAP. It's in October. It's virtual. Actually, all these are in October 11th and uh, one is in August 12th. And we're offering 25% uh, off. So that concludes our presentation, um, but I'd like to open it up for questions. 
And uh, one of the questions uh, I have is how long will it take to get certified from stage one? Tim, can you answer that? That's a difficult question to answer. You know, good conformity breeds speed when it comes to certification. So when you first contact us, we will be providing a proposal for you. And then there will be some time for preparation for SGS. There will be the stage one audit, which uh, is primarily a document review period. And this is the first place where things can get derailed, but it rarely does. So if, uh, if all of your documentation is in place, then we'll be able to move on to the stage two audit, which typically will take a full week, plus about a half of a week in order to document the report. If there are non no nonconformities, again, we will be able to move more quickly. If there are some nonconformities, then we know that we have to have a, uh, an acceptable corrective action plan from you within 15 days. And then we have to, if, it, if there are uh, more serious infractions, grade four, grade five nonconformities, then it's going to take longer. We have to see the uh, implementation of your corrective actions and evidence. Sometimes that may require a second visit. And then there is the process of review. And the review process is where we go through two different stages of review, an administrative review to make sure that all of the components of the audit were covered. And then also the technical review where a reviewer goes back and makes sure that all of the technical requirements of the report are in place. Sometimes that requires queries back to the auditor, which sometimes will come back to the manufacturer. And um, so I think that in the real world, I think that it's between 30 and 60 days sometimes even up to 90 days, depending on what the condition of the nonconformities are. So I know it's like saying, how long is this disease gonna last? It's gonna last from two days to two years. It's a big span, but there's not a good answer that I can say, well, it's 45 days. <laughs> um, from my experience, typically when someone starts stage, um, stage one, uh, it's about six months to get your certificate. Uh, these are people who have a good quality management system, um, have very few nonconformances, and in that kind of situation, usually about six months. Um, another question is, uh, how does MedSAP help with MDR? I can help with that. Uh, there is a lot of overlap, and the notified bodies have said that if someone has MedSAP certificate, if they're certified by uh, SGS with a MedSAP certificate, the time to be audited for an MDR certificate, you can get cut in half. So if you have MedSAP and you're looking to get MDR down the road, it'll be half the time of the audit had it been just MDR by itself. How does uh, MedSAP apply for people who are virtual manufacturers? That's a great question. So a virtual manufacturer is subject to all of the same process requirements as a, an on-site uh, manufacturer. The review of the records is much different. However, we spend a lot, a lot of our time in written agreements, and that depends on the level of responsibility and the extent of controls that <clears throat> are in place for uh, contract manufacturers and suppliers, subcontractors. And, um, but, when we are looking at manufacturing, there are 20, 29 different possible tasks in uh, the production manufacturing process that have to be looked at or may need to be looked at depending on the applicability of the task to the man manufacturer. So we will need to look at records from your contract supplier in order to meet those requirements. 
And so we have to provide uh, evidence to the regulators that if you're not running the injection molding machine, you have taken it upon yourself to qualify someone who can run it, and that uh, you have a process in place to ensure that the device meets requirements. And so there's still an awful lot of auditing that must be done. And sometimes it's even more difficult because there's usually an exchange between the device manufacturer and the subcontractor. And sometimes we may have to ask for more records because they don't have them on site. Sometimes uh, the manufacturing occurs on the other side of the globe. And so that uh, can make uh, the exchange of information even more difficult. We try to ask for as much information uh, in advance of the audit so that we don't get tripped up uh, from a time standpoint for managing and controlling the audit. But all has to be uh, audited uh, regardless. How does one qualify their supplier? (laughs) Okay. So the the standard and the regulators uh, are very generic in their requirements for controlling suppliers. They lean on a phrase that says the extent of control. So the extent of control is a risk-based decision that you as a manufacturer have to be able to support to satisfy either a QMS auditor or a technical uh, documentation reviewer to make sure, yes, I agree, you've taken all the steps and you can ensure that the product meets requirements. So most manufacturers will have different requirements for how they control someone who manufactures a container that a sterile device goes in as opposed to a sterile pouch. That, a, uh, that will go into that container. So the container is just a cardboard box with printing on it. However, a sterile pouch is something that will maintain the sterility of the device over and until the point of use. So you can see that the extent of controls for someone who, is, who does packaging with a sterile pouch is very different from someone who may do uh, uh, packaging going into a carton. Uh, for companies who are also looking to qualify their suppliers, if their supplier is certified to a medical standard like 13.5, does that help? It helps them. Yeah, it helps qualify them. Where it may help is in your decision on how, on the extent of control that you maintain over that contract manufacturer. So, for instance, someone who holds an ISO 1345 certificate from a a respected registrar or notified body would be different from someone who has no quality management system. And so you've got to obviously have a higher level of control over someone who does not have a quality management system that meets the requirements of a medical device manufacturer. So when we come in, we're looking at records and support that the uh, manufacturing of the device meets the requirements of the device, but it has. We, we don't really care all that much about whether the supplier was ISO 1345 certified. So if, if you are relying on that, we will be looking at your records to make sure that you have ensured that they are meeting your requirements for certification. So if you require an implant manufacturer to have an ISO 1345 certificate, we want to look at your records to make sure that you've got one of their certificates on on hand, that it that it is uh, not expired, that it's current. And then if you have further controls like on-site supplier audits. So we are, remember, we are assessing your QMS, not your device. That's a different program. We are looking at the QMS, which keeps all of the requirements corralled and making sure that you meet those requirements. All right, thank you, Tim. I think that's all the time we have for questions. I just want to give 
one thing about the 510k reviews for that SGS does. Um, we basically act as an arm of the FDA in the review process. We can't help you gather technical documents that you need to pass your review. We only do the review on the FDA's behalf. It's quicker, and that's the benefit of using SGS for that. Um, with that, I'll pass it to Carolyn to close the meeting. Thank you, Tim and Dan, for sharing your knowledge on the MDSAT process. Um, and thank you to SGS for sponsoring today's webinar. Attendees can learn more about SGS at sgs.com, and you can access the on-demand version of this webinar next week at the Bone Zone website so that you can review it again or share it with your colleagues. So thank you very much and have a great day.